Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television here on The Point of View. We pick the right topics, get the right guests, ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. Tonight we'll be looking at Ghana's digitalization agenda spearheaded by the Vice President, His Excellency Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. It's been on for a few years. We'll be reviewing how well it's going. We'll try and understand how that fits into the government's overall development strategy. We'll find out what's working and what's not working. I have a very special guest who's not just an activist, actually a technology entrepreneur who's done some innovative products in the healthcare space and in other spaces. Bryce Simmons will be talking to me tonight as we review three or four years of the digitalization agenda. Stay with us. Welcome back. So tonight we are, we are continuing our series which is trying to preview the year. We already began with a political preview. We also looked at Africa and geopolitics and spent a bit of time discussing the economy. So we want to look at the digital agenda spearheaded by the vice president in particular for two reasons. Because yesterday there was a front page story in the Business and Financial Times in the bottom right corner. Digital reforms are necessary for building a vibrant economy. And this story came from a program he attended at the University of Ghana, a story written by Kizito Kujo, and it basically just a few paragraphs says the realization of a strong and vibrant economy is dependent on the country's ability to build solid systems and institutions on the back of the ever-increasing digital transformation being witnessed globally. I'm sure you've heard some people say the vice president used to be the economic messiah. Why is he now talking about digital issues? Well, he says there's a connection that you can't develop an economy without a proper appreciation of digitalization and making the economy digitally ready. So for him, it's the same thing. So indeed, on the 2nd of November 2021, he gave what many consider a seminal speech, transforming an economy through digitalization, the Ghana story. It was a long speech after which he had a chat with Patrick Ewa, a very respected education entrepreneur who questioned him on his digital plan. He was also questioned by students. It was over a three-hour program. Some of the highlights from that event I will show you as the basis for what you consider maybe the MPP government's digital manifesto. It has a number of points. So we've put out or we've managed to glean about 16 projects under this digital agenda and then eight thematic areas. And my guest will help us break down What's really working and what's not? So some of the things he mentioned in the Ashesi speech, issuance of biometric national ID, we know there's the Ghana card. That's pr probably at the center of all of this. The digital address system, which was executed initially by Ghana Post and a company called Vocacom, and then there was LUSPA, the land use and special planning authority also coming in there. Then there's mobile money interoperability. Then there's the universal QR code payment system as part of the projects central bank digital currency, the ECD, coming up. Some of these have not yet been done. Then there's the digitalization of the passport office of the ports of the DVLA. There's also something called the birth and death digitalization, the Ghana.gov platform, digitalization of the tax filing process, national common platform for property tax administration, NHIA, e-pharmacy, which is digitalization of pharmacies in Ghana. Then free Wi-Fi to secondary schools, 46 colleges of education, district education offices, and universities. Indeed, the program at which he made this comment I read in the BNFT, uh, it was actually a program at the University of Ghana at a laptop award ceremony and launching of the One Student, One Laptop Initiative, which is then part of this overall agenda. So you have him uh, assisting the vice chancellor presenting a laptop to a student. Then there's digitalizing of the Lands Commission, Registering all cocoa farmers and their farms, digitalization of fertilizer, etc., etc. So these are some of the things they want to do. He also lists what he calls his eight-point agenda for digital development. So number one, a system 
with unique identification numbers for the population. I'll put this on the screen for you to see. A system which addresses with addresses for all properties and locations in Ghana. That's number two. Three, a system that is transparent and promotes accountability, discipline, and trustworthiness. That's number four. A system that's inclusive and not based on who you know. A system that provides efficient public services, delivery, and tackles corruption. A system that improves efficiency in the health and educational sectors. A system that provides financial inclusion and a cash-like economy. And a system that enhances domestic revenue mobilization and tax collection. So those are the eight criteria he has for an economy that is ready to leverage the digital dividend. So who's my guest? Bryce Simmons. Bryce Simmons is the founder of M Pedigree. He is also, I call him a part-time activist because he's honorary vice president of Imani. And he's also a conference speaker. What else are you? <laughs> Rabble Rouser is what I've heard lately. <laughs> well, it helps the conversation. But I need people to know that you've been interested in technology for a very long time. Indeed. Not only in terms of activism and writing about that, actually practicing. Mm -hmm. So that the M Pedigree and the Gold Keys platform is almost like your work mm -hmm. as a technology person. And how is that going? Indeed. Well, it's going well in some countries, much more difficult in other countries. Africa is very difficult um, as, a, uh, as a, um, an integrated market. So we find out that when we're doing well in other places, we're doing less well elsewhere. Mm. Uh, when did you get interested in Dr. Baumier's digital agenda? I, 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 in my view, he's one, probably the few vice presidents who's been given a bit of space to lead something very meaningful. I, I was, right. yes, initially it was quite as exhilarating, right? It was, um, um, the feeling was one of initial shock, right? That like someone will elevate digitalization to such a high profile. And then, you know, as he persisted, it was quite, in, you know, it tend to intrigue. And then over time, I become more cynical. So the initial excitement that you have such a high profile promoter of something that has long been marginalized in our part of the world, you know, technology and the prospects that it holds for our development has not always received um, the best attention from the powerful. So to have somebody that powerful make it um, more or less his flag mast, you know, was very, very inspiring. And I was continually impressed until it became clear to me that the, Dr. Bermuda appeared to have lashed on this to appeal to a youthful audience, to create a new narrative that will make him stand apart from other politicians. And while that is not necessarily bad, I felt a bit betrayed because it looked like it was primarily political PR as opposed to a genuine commitment to the policy of using digitalization to transform Ghana and the way we do but public service. Isn't that a bit harsh if you consider the number of, the sheer number of projects that we've mentioned? At least, I, I, I counted at least 15, if not more, that should count for something that under uh, this government, ID, ID card, universal QR code, MMI, passport, all kinds of things going on. It, I mean, should you not give a bit of credit to the fact that even if it's for branding purposes, some things are actually happening which will eventually help the country? Yeah, I mean, over the last two decades, um, Ghana, compared to its peers, has done fairly well in digitalization and, you know, the digital economy in Ghana compared to um, its peer country hasn't been too bad. We've okay. seen significant, we've, re, we've increased uh, mobile um, penetration. Mm -hmm. The number of people have mobile phones have gone up from about 2% to now in excess of what? A hundred and something percent if you consider the double subscription. But at the very mm -hmm. least, I, I bet at least 80% to 90% of people have at least one SIM card. Mm -hmm. So that is huge um, improvement. Even in, in respect of landlines and, and, and broadband where we haven't done too well, we've done better than the average African country. So I don't deny that there's been improvement. I don't think it's certainly been improvement that you can limit only to uh, the Dr. Baumiera, though in some respects um, he, he's, they've been quite successful. So in national identification, the total number of uh, people that have received national ID cards have been the highest since um, we started going electronic with, with ID systems. Mm. When you think of uh, mobile money interoperability, the speed at which it was deployed under the current administration has been faster than in previous attempts. You mm -hmm. all know the famous um, um, situation with the previous contract mm -hmm. for mobile um, interoperability that ended up in arbitration. So there are bright spots. The problem is that taking as a whole, taking as a whole, it is not transformative. And in some respects, it's actually quite problematic. There are instances where I fear 
that because it's so hyper branded and it's so you know the political stakes are so high because the way it's been charged many people are careful being you know scrutinizing developments in the sector in order to push for real reform and true improvement mm -hmm. because if you do that it appears as if you are taking on dr baumia and not many people want to take on a certain vice president so i think in that res respect it's been actually quite sinister because so many things that we could have put um, an emphasis on and ensure that we fix them um, are still lingering and are still causing problems. And obviously, in the course of the conversation, mm. I will delve into okay. them. Let's start with the eight point agenda that I think his Ashesi speech outlined. Yes. Uh, I don't know what you made of that. Patrick Ewa inviting. Patrick Ewa is probably the poster boy for a returnee who's doing something developmental. Mm. Ashesi is highly respected. So it looks like a nicely organized event. I watched it, it was very long. And, and Patrick himself is a technologist. Patrick yeah. worked for Microsoft, um, with yeah. which I'm also affiliated in, a, in some capacity, yeah. for many, many years. Yeah. Um, and of course, Patrick is someone that I know and respect deeply. Yeah. I think that it was, the feeling was, d digital is linked to innovation, and Ashasi has an innovation agenda. Ashasi be yeah. believes that not only is innovation critical mm -hmm. to helping us address some of the age-old problems in corruption, you know, we talk about corruption, efficiency, et cetera, Innovation is also how we're going to grow the economy. Mm -hmm. And digital has become increasingly intertwined with innovation. Yeah. So a lot of people talk of innovation, they think of the role of digital. Yeah. And with the current convergence, what we call the convergence, every other sector, whether it's in biotech, whether it's in nanotech, whether it's in nuclear engineering, with regard to the field you think of, there is a digitization ongoing. So for that reason, if you think of transformation, you can't seriously divorce or divorce it from innovation, from, from digital innovation. Mm. And I think that is why that speech was considered important. Um, but as I said, you can, you, can, you can approach it with this very forward-looking, very progressive you know, mindset. And then you can also look at it very realistically and say, how committed is Dr. Bermia to an actual digital agenda, to an actual transformation program? And mm. that is where people like myself, who are also activists in our, in our outlook, Mm. tend to have problems. Good. So he gives an eight-point agenda which we will analyze. Mm -hmm. Just to run through quickly again. Mm -hmm. So a system with a unique identification number or a system with unique identification numbers for the population. Mm -hmm. A system with addresses for all properties and locations. Mm -hmm. A system that's transparent and promotes accountability, discipline, and trustworthiness. An inclusive system not based on who you know. A system that provides efficient public services, delivery, and tackles corruption. That improves efficiency in the health and education sectors. Provides financial inclusion in a cash light economy. That enhances domestic revenue mobilization. So these are the eight pillars of his digital manifesto. Mm -hmm. Taken together, what do you make of this? No, it's fascinating because those are also the very areas where in recent times we've had big case studies. Mm. which tell us whether or not the government is genuinely committed to these um, very lofty ideals. Mm -hmm. um, and so I find that fascinating for that score. So it looks like it was very well chosen. And we, or maybe unfortunately for, for, for the vice president, we also have enough evidence in those particular areas to question the commitment. Mm. And, in hope, and hopefully in, in question the commitment, we hope for a change in the approach that he's taking. We, we are not just criticizing for criticizing stake. We have very clear... Um, views about how he can change the tack and return to the lofty approach that you know initially characterized mm. his involvement in, in the digital economy mm. and, and the policies. Uh, so uh, you used two words which I want you to in, I want to interrogate. You said initially you were fascinated, mm -hmm. but you realized that it's not transformative enough, mm -hmm. and then some are quite problematic. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like the degeneration mm -hmm. of emotion from fascination to skepticism to almost cynicism. Yeah. So what is problem, what, what, what's the criteria for analyzing this, these many projects and this eight-point agenda? What criteria mm. are you going to use? I think, one, policy coherence is important. And from almost all the big matters that we are talking about, mm -hmm. um, there are internal contradictions that fuel the cynicism. It's almost as if, if they genuinely were doing this in good faith, you shouldn't see this. I get you. So we have a number of major case studies about the digital agenda, where it's quite clear that if the vice president and his um, policy advisory team, as well as the government, of course, were genuinely committed to digital transformation, they wouldn't do things that way. So that's number one, policy coherence. So if How, there's an incoherence in the policy... Or a contradiction in terms of objective versus actual practice. 
I get it. The second one is to look at our lost potential, which is where we had so much potential, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden we are not realizing that potential. That is one of the ways in which one will usually um, become skeptical over time or lose an initial fascination for something, right? What do you mean by that? So you lost start off potential. with something, and then the thing seems to be you know, um, highly promising. It's going to be great. And then over time, you don't see that greatness. You, know, you actually start okay. getting decline, uh, diminishing returns. So underutilized capacity. It's an example. If you have that. capacity that you're developing, and initially, therefore, that made people extremely um, positive. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you're not using that capacity. Or all mm -hmm. of a sudden, you're not seeing those returns. Mm -hmm. or, you know, that is one of the ways in which usually people lose um, mm -hmm. hope in, in, the, in the likely success of an activity. I see. So policy incoherence, lost potential. So that's your framework for analyzing this. Is there anything else in that? Well, there are two other, you know, um, should I call them gauges or, or measures, mm -hmm. which in the course of the conversation become apparent. I, I get. Okay, so you are saying that there are case studies of policy incoherence mm -hmm. in the period that the government has tried to implement the digital agenda. Well, we've been what, okay, what's the, the agenda what's the for best, a long time? What's the best example? What's the most immediate example of that? The, we've been implementing the digital agenda for a long time. Mm -hmm. In the, between 2007 to 2014, mm -hmm. the World Bank gave us 100 and something million dollars. We spent about 80 million dollars of it mm -hmm. doing something called e-transform. Yes. Most of the things you see today are linked somewhat to e-transform, including okay. the famous e-services mm -hmm. um, and framework that we like to talk about. Mm -hmm. So Ghana.gov is a direct mm -hmm. output of, of the e-services. E e-transform. E no, e-services, which was an output of um, e-transform. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing this for a while, but then the government decided to raise it to the level of um, a, a, a profile mm -hmm. and to a level of importance and priority that we've not seen before in a long time. Mm -hmm. So that was significant. And now the question is, going forward, do we have the evidence to justify that they do have that commitment? So, I mean, a big example would be the ongoing SIM registration, mm -hmm. where we've had amazing, amazing contradictions at every level. Mm. So first of all, the government says its policy is to integrate databases mm -hmm. and ensure that we have a national identification infrastructure mm -hmm. that will stop things like creating confusion among agencies. Mm -hmm. This one collecting data here, this one collecting another data, and you, you end up spending more money, et cetera, et cetera. Now you have a situation where the National Identification Authority purports to be the lead regulator of all identification matters in the country. Mm -hmm. And you have the NCA but Which I think that's backed by law. It's not a proportion. I think the law says that. Well, fine. I mean, <laughs> we will we, we'll grant them that. Yes. Though, of course, if you break things down into greater and greater complexity, it depends mm -hmm. on what you mean. Mm -hmm. But that's fine. Mm -hmm. So they are the National Identification Authority, and you are trying to register people and ensure that you, you link their SIM card to their identity properly. Mm -hmm. So naturally, in that, such an exercise, you have an interagency coordination issue. Yeah. What did we discover? What we discovered was because the NIA primarily has become extremely beholden to private commercial interests, because the way they designed the national uh, identity architecture as a public-private partnership, which was not bad. It was a great idea. But they had, a, they, they had some difficulty thinking through the cost implications. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong having a commercial strategy to back a public interest agenda because it can help with sustainability. So PPPs are great. But when you are doing that, you have to bear in mind that overall cost will have an impact, effect on whether or not you can actually deliver on public interest. So because of that, the NIA typically operates with half its mind on the commercials. We think that th there is too much emphasis on the commercial that it begins to interfere with the ability to look purely at the public interest. So when they were approached about how to achieve the integration of the national identity database with the... Um, communications um, effort that was underway, my reading of what we've been able to unearth so far is that both the NCA and the NIA were completely subservient to commercial interests and were not thinking right. They were not thinking along public interest lines. So the NIA tried to create the impression that there is no way NCA could you know, do this verification thing unless it made money. If you really carefully the interactions that they were having. So they said, for instance, well, so the, the, the simple uh, 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 issue on the table was you want people to connect their SIM cards to their ID cards. We are going to create a mechanism whereby through USSD, people 
will indicate interest in re-registration. And obviously now they made it mandatory. Can they also send their PIN? And then we check their PIN being the PIN of the national ID card. And then we check with their surname and their PIN correspondence. Compare the data that you have mm -hmm. with the data they are given that is associated with their SIM card to see if there is parity. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a very sensible, straightforward thing to do because NI has spent time not only collecting people's um, and ID Data. information, mm -hmm. but in some respects, it's also even collecting people's SIM information yes. during registration. So if you send me the, uh, the PIN, and you say, here is a SIM number, here is a PIN, does that correspond? They should just be able to come back to you and say, yeah, it corresponds. Why do you need people queuing up to, in the sun? To take their, to their metrics that? again. If policy coherence was to be attained, the issue of integration to be attained, there's no reason why NIA and NCA should be seen to be working at cross purposes. Indeed. So my argument is that because they were being primarily driven by commercial interest, they could not keep their eye on the public interest and take the most rational, most efficient decisions. So with this back and forth, Kelly GVG then saw the window to say, oh, we don't even have to waste your time with these people. We will just provide an app that will do exactly this. NIA then start to write to you know, various stakeholders trying to suggest that what the NCA is doing is illegal. That the data that is being collected for future verification cannot happen that way because NIA must be part of the initial collection. But being part of the initial collection also meant that you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Now, if they were being purely a public interest organization, the costs would not be that high. Again. But because they're operating with private and commercial interests behind them, every time they bring a bill is too high. So when they decide that they want to charge you half um, a CD for every time you do a verification, and you tally that up, and it goes to something close to $4 million, mm. immediately, and you want to put all that cost on private sector, the telecoms and their interest mm. also starts now to converge with the Kelvin GBG side of the thing, and not the NIA. Though of course, this so, so this is your here. first evidence of policy incoherence leading to an inefficiency. We'll take a break. This is the point of view. We're trying to analyze... Um, the digitalization agenda of the government by Simons is my guess. And we'll delve into other projects as well. The first one, of course, being the most high profile, the re-registration of SIMS. But there are other issues, e-levy inclusive. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. Tonight, my guest is by Simmons. We are trying to analyze the digitalization agenda of the government spearheaded by the vice president. By Simmons says initially he was fascinated. Then he felt that the uh, digital agenda was not transformative. Now he's concerned that some of the issues are incoherent in terms of policy, and we are not actually working in the public interest. So yes, NCA and NIA could have worked better together. They could have made this more simpler, achieved the role of integration. But there's a lot of projects. I mentioned about 17 projects that the government wants to do. Obviously, you can't use one example to say that that means that the, the agenda is not working. Yes, but most of these are flagship or highly important. So the SIM card registration thing, for instance, has dominated the headlines now for almost a month. That tells you the degree of public interest. The national addressing system, which the vice president mentioned as one of the key successes, is actually not that of a success, if you look at it very carefully. Mm -hmm. Even when... Google had made this plus code system available for free. And if you didn't want to use the Google model, you can go to the, source, the core um, source of these systems and then build an open source implementation that you, you wish to use. We don't do that. Rather, we decide that we're going to get a commercial solution and then deploy the commercial solution. Okay, fine. Now we've spent that money. We've created this national addressing system. Mm -hmm. We are going around trying now to deliver a value proposition for it. Mm -hmm. Because the truth of the matter is that if somebody wants to come to your location and deliver a parcel to you, it depends on the app they are using that will help them with navigation. So you are, you are at CTFM. If you are coming from Latvia or Koshi to CTFM. It depends on who is coming. So, so if, for instance, if it's Glovo or uh, Uber, Bolt, uh, Uber or Bolt or whatever it, is that, whatever it is that is coming to you, that will determine how they get there. So they will plug into the most widely used geolocation system to get to you, right? Which is Google. Which is Google or any other service that the app they are using is connected to. Mm -hmm. None of those major platforms that are used for navigation in this country is plugged directly into the Ghana GPS thing because it doesn't make sense, right? So if you are using Uber, Bolt, Glovo, Jumia, whatever it is that you are using, 
whatever app you are using, um, will not necessarily go and connect to the Ghana Post GPS, right? So let's say you decide that, okay, I'm going to give you my Ghana Post GPS address. That entity must go and download the Ghana Post GPS address and substitute it for what it has already got. What is the benefit of that? So in this case, what should they have done? What they should have done is decide what it is that they want to do. If they, they want, to, they, they want to, to, they want to give every, so they want to give CTFM a digital address. No. They don't want to use CTFM as a name. They want to use CTFM so that the next door neighbor's digital address is also in the same. Maybe they don't want to use Mr. Kofi's pink house. Mm -hmm. So if you are coming to the house after CTFM, they mm -hmm. want a code that if you are coming there is a specific place you are coming to. First of all, it's unnecessary because, as I've said, if the person is going to navigate to the place using geolocation information, then that system itself will make that happen. So maybe what you want to do is increase the absorption of that type of solution that you're economy. So you are saying they shouldn't have even done the... In, in the first place, it's not very useful, right? Okay. Given that if I'm coming to your end, it depends on what kind of location system I'm using. Mm -hmm. the, the number itself is useless. If you give the villager 0 0.177 or 0 0.177 something, and say that's your address, and that villager, and I'm not using villager derogatorily, just somebody who lives in a village, mm -hmm. that villager has that code as the address. Mm -hmm. What is the utility unless there's somebody bringing something to them or something like that? And that person bringing something to them needs some app to navigate to that location. So in the end, that's the only utility. And the app doesn't recognize the GK. Unless you can somehow force everybody in Ghana using any technology to come and plug into the Ghana Post GPS thing. Otherwise, the dominant platforms will not use your system. So mm. that is basically putting the, the horse in front of the, the, the cats, mm. right? So the question then was, okay, now you've gone ahead and you've spent all this money and you've done it. What do you move on to achieve? The only way you move on to make use of that system is if you embed the Ghana Post GPS system itself into a wide range of applications so that at least in the government system, mm. it's interconnected for a, a range of matters for which we have geospatial need, mm -hmm. like land registration, a whole bunch of those things. And then, at least people that are using the government services will have utility. Rather than spend the money on that, you know what they spend the money on? They spend the money printing the codes on um, plaques to go and stick on houses. Mm. What, what is the point of, of that logic? How, how does it really contribute anything to stick some code on there? That so people there? can know that this is a digital address. No, but if I have a digital address and I want to communicate that digital address, it will be because of a particular utility. Somebody's doing something for me. Somebody's coming to my house. So why was there? Remember, but that code is it, arbitrary. It's an address not useful in itself. That this is my my digital address. No, because it's an arbitrary code. Mm. So an it, address, could, it could be any code. It could be anything randomly. So it, it has no meaning. It doesn't mean anything except for the fact that very a system must use it. When you are walking by a road and you see Martin Loop, you are counting things like number one Martin Loop, number seven Martin Loop, or oh, Martin Loop is adjacent to this other street. You are using that landmark system in your human navigation, like a bed will do, right? When you change that to geolocation, you shift it from human navigation to machine navigation. And now those arbitrary codes mean nothing except to the machine. So it's completely ridiculous to then spend money to go and print it and stick it there, as if that had a meaning as okay. far as the navigation space was concerned. Fine. So when he went to Ashesi, then said they are talking to Google to now integrate the system. Which makes no sense because Google has a free system called Plus Codes that countries like Nepal have adopted and are using for free to do the same. So thing. there's no need to even go to Google? Well, you can go to Google, but then what is Google supposed to do with it? I don't get it. Google has a system. It has, it's called Plus Codes. Okay. It does the same thing that you want to do. Uh -huh. It has given it for free. It says every country that one they should come. Uh -huh. Some countries have gone, you have used it, it's free. Mm -hmm. You said, no, you go and spend money and build your own thing. Now, somehow Google should come and incorporate your thing into their system. What is the point? So my point is that it's incoherent and it's confusing. So, so that's, that's, that's a second example. example. So, then, so the Ghana Google GPS was, was not... What about medical drones? That, they, that, that has been... Given quite a bit of publicity, we've gotten coverage for it internationally. Sending blood, uh, anti snake venom to rural places. It's been a great branding exercise, and I admit that you know the country has earned some branding products from it, and that is not invaluable. That's valuable. That's not non valuable. That's valuable. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I think that let's go back to the original critique. The original critique was that it's too expensive for it to be a major part of how we move goods around. We said it costs, when you do, you do your computation, maybe $20 mm -hmm. per packet. Now, if you are moving medicine and stuff like that around, mm -hmm. something that costs even $10 per item means that the vast majority of items you want to deliver are unprofitable. Because you know that a a, what, how much does a box of paracetamol cost? How much does a pouch of blood cost? How much does uh, a box of condoms cost? So when you have such high cost per unit, it already tells you that this is going to play a very small role 
in respect of matters where you have extreme urgency and lives are really at stake. You cannot be using it to transport ordinary commodities. It must only transport things that are so precious, given the time factor. Like snake serum, somebody has been bitten by a snake three hours. So we said it should be used for emergency alone. On top of that, it should be used for places where, even for emergencies, that is because you cannot deploy a normal emergency response system mm -hmm. like a motorcycle-based delivery system. Okay. The government didn't do that. Rather, they've gone ahead and built four major, actually, I think now it's six, distribution centers. You know what is fascinating about, about that? First, we have to take the goods, the medicines or whatever it is that is in the public system, you know, the medicines, the mm -hmm. other supplies, carry them to these distribution centers that are spotted all over the place. And then when you need the items, you send them a message, and then they put it on a drone and catapult it to you. Mm. That is not a, necessarily a ridiculous idea if you are doing it for a very small amount of you know, goods or services. Mm -hmm. Where, on the other hand, you have a situation where your central medical stores is struggling to get vehicles to transport goods to your regional medical stores. Mm. And the regional medical stores are struggling to get cars to transport goods to your district medical stores. And you have an inventory system that is broken and therefore uh, medical supplies are expiring and are getting lost in the system and we cannot do inventory reconciliation and the rest of it. That is not where you spend the money. So we advise the government that spend this money on a small emergency kind of plug in and rather invest in revitalizing the current mm. medical supplies distribution system. So here to your incoherence. I think they opted for the sexier solution. That has been a, a, a challenge. Let's talk about mobile interoperability because if you listen to the vice president's speech, he says that when they assumed office, 70% of people in Ghana had no bank accounts, 80% of adult population had mobile phones. They realized that the mobile uh, phone money market was growing, mobile money market was growing. So they wanted to implement what they call mobile money interoperability. And they did that initially with GIPS at the center of this. And then the vice president makes a very interesting statement that um, achieving mobile money market small features, we did it. The data shows that because of MMI, Ghana is the fastest growing mobile money market in Africa. And then it says banks are responding to a competition for the unbank from the mobile money service providers. Then it says this was December. Next month, all banks in Ghana will launch a bank-wide mobile money wallet, which will be available to customers and non-customers through a mobile app. And then he also says that um, the payment systems they are put in place, it's easy to open a traditional bank account. And then for an informal sector dominated by cash payments, most merchants are reluctant to accept other forms of payment. They've launched an investor QR code system. And then while QR code payments exist around the world, investor QR code where all banks and mobile money service providers and fintechs are on one platform with interoperability between uh, bank accounts and wallets is a rarity. Ghana is the first country in Africa to implement such a QR code payment system. And then they also talk about other things like digital currency and things. So on the mobile money side and the interoperability side, we can see the benefit. Yes, I mean, there's no doubt that when it comes to the financial innovation segment um, of, of the whole digital economy, um, there's been quite some impressive um, developments, but we still have limitations. So, in, 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 you know, the government, for instance, is taking credit for the, the boom in payments, um, and it, it's trying to suggest that that's all to do with mobile money into probability, but that cannot be correct, right? Because if you look at current mobile money, mm -hmm. which is the biggest segment, so we have maybe 130 billion uh, transactions mm -hmm. and um, of that uh, no we have like three point something billion uh, transactions mm -hmm. of that three billion of those transactions are mobile money transactions and of the 130 billion dollars or so of transactional value about 110 billion dollars of it is mobile money so mobile mm -hmm. money is the biggest um, chunk mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but in mobile money also on net transactions are the biggest so the transaction you do with DMT and the transaction you do with DIN Vodafone are by far the biggest. So to, to attribute that growth to mobile money interoperability appears to suggest that they are not looking carefully at what is really happening, which sometimes I also have a problem with because sometimes I see that they do diagnosis and that the diagnosis that they do are not always very well linked to the evidence. So if you have on-net transactions being by far predominant, you can't claim that the search in payments are due to interoperability among operators. That's not, that's not correct. But that notwithstanding, it's a great thing that they've got into probability done. The previous government tried to do the same PPP model, where rather than focus on public interest, it was driven by what the private uh, entity, the contractor, could make. So they came up with this ridiculous amount that you know they were going to have to recover in the billion dollars that we were supposed to cover. Four point something billion or something. Uh, Ghana cities, I think. I think it was yeah, yeah some very See, huge four, four amount. Four billion cities, yeah. And the, that, the idea was that they were going to recover that money through fees. 
which is very similar to what they've done with the national ID card, which we have a problem with. So now that the government decided, no, let's just get a contractor to do it for the government, and then, re -op then open that up to the other ecosystem players to interconnect, we've seen significant progress, and that's impressive. But we still have challenges. You still have issues where GIFT, for instance, has this interconnectivity model that does not benefit a lot of the smaller players in the ecosystem. So getting access to the banking, uh, the bank banking network in Ghana compared to countries that are doing open banking um, is still not very um, advanced. But I acknowledge that when it comes to fintech, um, generally Ghana is in the right direction. So the, right direction. the data payment infrastructure is working, which is why you and other people may think that e-levy could affect that. So even though we're, we're giving credit for the growth in digital financial services generally, mm -hmm. I think you've said in a, an article that the e-levy could erode some of that. Yes, because by looking at payments and not looking at the digital economy in its entirety, you are doing the same policy incoherence thing that we are complaining about. Mm. So what it means is that you are not looking at what is it that is growing fastest. Mm. And a lot of that is basically informal activities where people are just using digital tools to drive that informal activity. So the famous watch, you know, buying watch on WhatsApp or buying dresses on, that you saw on Instagram. Mm. A lot of that is digital commerce, but it's not digital commerce in the way that you can easily see in tax. Mm -hmm. Like you see that Jumia is there, Glovo is there, and the rest of it. So what you have to be careful about is that you don't introduce new policies that entrenches that informal digitalization. So otherwise, digitalization or digital becomes another instrument or tool that drives informality. Mm -hmm. But you are trying to bring in digitalization to increase formalization of the economy. Mm -hmm. So don't introduce taxes that makes people feel that, oh, okay, actually, I don't want to pay on an online platform because they'll charge me. Rather, let me do the transaction on the online platform by pay offline by giving the money to an agent. So what is going to happen with E-Levy is they're going to see a lot of agent banking and agent services emerging because people want to evade the online tax. So, what do I, so if you exempt, let's say, internet banking, let's mm -hmm. say you exempt internet banking, then you have the person that is sitting under the tree have an internet banking account. Mm -hmm. And then when you go to them, it says, don't do mobile money because it's expensive. Mm -hmm. I will transfer it from my internet banking application to the other person, and you will pay me off the table. So now what happens is that rather than the person discovering online services and then paying with Momo herself and over time using USSD to do commerce and things like that, they increasingly rely on agents because they want to evade the tax. And then you have an agent-driven ecosystem that does not nourish the growth of online services. So we are saying that pay attention to all those possibilities. Model it. Mm. Determine what should you exempt, what should you not exempt. How would, if you exempt this but not exempt this, how would that play? To be a very fascinating example, in the current model, mm -hmm. in the current model, quasi-government services are not exempted. What the government want to do. So if I am cocoa board and I want to pay farmers, mm -hmm. all of a sudden my cost has increased because that is not considered paying government. But cocoa board is a quasi-government service, it's a public service. So if you're going to charge me for using mobile money to give to the farmers, it affects my cost. Maybe some investments I was going to make in digital, I'm not going to make them any further because all of a sudden I realize that my costs are going up. And those kinds of issues, because we don't carefully think through the implications, and why don't we think through the implications? We have an echo chamber kind of policy making. All the people in the room are in one party. All of them are beholden to the president because he appointed them and they want to please the president. Mm. So nobody's in the room asking hard questions. There's almost no serious policy debate. And so nobody's asking these type of questions. So you're, you're basically saying that the E-Levy is a wrong diagnosis. Of a problem. It would, we, we, we are, I think we are hoping to raise over a billion dollars. You don't mm. think they can raise that? No, they can't raise the $1.15 um, uh, billion dollars mm. because the way in which they are anticipating the exemptions to work does not anticipate behavioral changes to fit in the exemptions. So, so what, people will rebel. They will find all manner of ways to game the system. So don't, don't raise the one billion. No, because as soon as it becomes significant, that means that the cost is being felt in the economy. People will find ways around it. We've seen it in many countries. Don't, don't, don't forget that e levy is not anything novel. The Kenyans have been doing on this. We are trying to put it on both the fees and the transaction. The uh, Ugandans have been doing it now for three and a half years. Uganda is making about $27 million a year from it, roughly. And if you adjust for our size, which is bigger than Uganda by, by five or something times in terms of scale mm. and value, and you adjust for the fact that their rate is lower because when they did it at, um, uh, they initially tried to push it at 2%, yeah, there was war in Kampala, and the government had to retreat back so to So you are saying 5%. that the amount we are raising 
we are proposing to Renori. But you're also saying if you're just that, that you're going to get maybe four hundred million dollars. Yeah, but beyond that, you're saying that it, there could even be a deformalization of the digital sector if you don't design it right. And to design it right, it can be something that somebody sits in the in the finance ministry announces it, and then every MPP MP just lines up to go and vote for it. There must be debate within the MPP itself about its design. That's how in every you can you can go to the U.S. implement a, a radical policy change and expect that every Republican um, congressman and every Republican senator will just line up and just they themselves have to look at it and say. So, what so is you think there's a misunderstanding that what you call the digital business progression? Yes, because what it is is that how you become a formalized economy. Uh, in the digital realm is mm -hmm. different from in the traditional realm because of all the intermediary stages. So in the chart you show, mm -hmm. the traditional business progression is basically from informal to formal. But for digital, you have about 10 steps? Yes, multiple steps around identity because you have an identity mechanism. Mm -hmm. So you have situations where somebody may be just a freelancer, so he's just doing micro work. But notwithstanding the fact that he's just a freelancer and doing micro work, because of the fact that it's digital, the traditional anonymization is removed. And therefore, he's partially formal. So there are a lot of partial. So from social media, mobile money, license and permits, all the way to income tax. Indeed, and I was just hoping that you could project. We, we, we will put it up. I will okay. put it up. So, so, so you're basically saying that if the design of the e levy doesn't think about all of this and mm -hmm. is just thinking about assuming we can raise a certain amount of money, mm -hmm. not only will we fail to raise the money, it can actually reduce our rate of formalizing the economy. Exactly, because in the, the digital segment in the digital segment, rather than encouraging people to do more online, so I, I, I buy the item, but I pay on, online the rest, you encourage what currently happens. People don't want to pay online because they don't trust a bunch of things, right? Mm -hmm. So they say, you know, I place the order, but when you come, then I give you cash. Mm. Have you observed that there's a lot of that in the delivery ecosystem, in the e-logistics ecosystem? Yes. That is not full formalization, A right? lot of the drivers say, I, I want cash, I don't want... Yes, that's one. That, uh, there's also the pay on delivery. They don't want to pay until you bring it to them. Now, before you change behavior, you want people to be highly driven by the convenience factor and the low cost factor so that they overcome their trust issues. Because the reason why they do that is a lot of these trust issues. Uber so, ELB will destroy that. It might if you don't design it properly. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll look at other things. So, apart from all the big programs, there's also attempts to promote digital entrepreneurship. I think two weeks ago, the government spoke about the agri technology in agri or something. And they were, there's a lot of programs they've launched. We'll mm -hmm. try and analyze some of that. This is the point of view. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're still on the point of view assessing the digital agenda, digitalization agenda, championed by the vice president, by Simmons is my guest. Okay, what about entrepreneurial support programs? The government has tried to do a lot of things in that space. I think two weeks ago they did something in agri tech tech in agri or something. And there's always these monies for people to do kinds of things. Have you analyzed that? Obviously that should be a fair yeah, th 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 there's been some studies on that. I mean um, you 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 the country diagnostic, the formal country diagnostic takes takes note of the incoherence among the programs. So in the we have about forty youth entrepreneurship employment schemes that are all supposed to be correlated but are not well correlated. And then within that, about 22 of them are tilted towards um, digital. Mm -hmm. So roughly 22 of them are, are, are tilted towards digital. And if you you projected, yes, yeah, so we have it. So uh -huh. we have so the girls in ICT, good, startup good, Ghana, good, good. Odmet, NEIP, yep, incubation programs, different incubating programs, some youth of them in, in ICT, the app, yeah. NEIP, YE. Yep. E transform EDC. There's quite a bit of this. There's quite a bit of it, and then what what you realize in most of these situations is that you 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 come against this inability for the government to be internally critical. Mm. So you say, okay, the auditor general does a number of performance reviews. Some of it, some of, a lot of the policies in this country don't undergo any serious performance reviews. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, the auditor general, in doing financial uh, control, decides to do a, a bit of performance reviews. We don't really know whether any of these programs are yielding any benefits to the economy. From what we can tell, by failure rates, et cetera, the little sampling that has happened, most of these um, startups that are giving support are not the ones that today are raising millions of dollars around the world that we hear about, or even the ones that local venture capitalists are putting in money. So somehow, when the government chooses who benefits, it does such a bad job 
that most of the success stories that we are seeing are those that actually avoid the government's programs, really? which is frightening. You know, so if you go to MEST or mm -hmm. you go to um, Y Combinator, you go to uh, um, uh, 500 Startups or any of these premium places where they incubate these startups to greatness, and you look at the ones that have raised money, the ones that have expanded, the ones that are employing people, you don't see represented in them players that came through the government support programs. Mm. That's frightening, Over right? which period? The, over the last decade that we've seen. Wow. So you say, okay, so who, who are these people that they are giving all this money to? One time we tried to look at some of the um, payment rates, you know, because some of these things are designed like Paying loads. back. I'm, I'm Sorry, the pay, pay back repayments, rate, yeah. Repayment rates. And we said, okay, let's just look at the most recent one because that one, literally, they should have started paying by now because the, the grace period is over for the first set of uh, recipients, those that received their, their money in 2020 under the COVID uh, programs. So the ones that um, got an enterprise agency is responsible for handing the money out to. When we checked, and we very discreetly checked, because obviously they won't give you the information, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we very discreetly checked. Repayments are following the same trend as we've seen with Maslock, NAEP. They don't pay the money back. The equity that the government is supposed to hold properly, there's no SPV that holds the equity. Mm. So we are throwing a lot of money around, but it's not clear to us that there's a well thought through process even to measure whether or not these monies are mm. having a real impact. Wow. And that's a problem. Is this also under the government's digital agenda? Or this is essential? Because this is, some of this is employment creation. Some of this is under Ministry of Finance. That's a good point. So you, it may not be fair to put all of this under a digital... So, so this connects to the third um, level of the analysis, you know, that luckily you have given us some little time to kind of delve into, which is the lost promise or... The mm. met promise of the lost potential, or the met promise of, of 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 this whole administration. So, if you look at a place like Accra Digital Center, mm -hmm. 2011, Rockefeller World Bank gives us 10 million dollars. I think we managed to draw down about 8.3 million dollars. We set it up. We get a bunch of warehouses. We try to change it. It takes a while to operationalize. A new government comes into power. They operationalize it, and it's supposed to be a BPO center. I'm trying to link this to business press outsourcing. Now, the BPO and the Information Technology Enabled Services space are connected. And the primary goal, if you're building a BPO center in your country, is that you are following the path that others like the Philippines, India, and the rest have followed, where you are able to export ICT service and get foreign exchange. So that then very much ties into your economic strategy. Mm -hmm. Because we, re we really want to boost exports, right? And we don't only want to boost exports, we want to boost exports that increases our local value addition where we have people that have skills and they are doing, uh, adding value to other people's um, processes. Since 2015, when ACS withdrew, we've seen significant reduction in outputs in BPO in Ghana. And therefore, ICT exports are also dropping accordingly, or at the very least, are very fragile and very episodic. So in that respect, you say, OK, you go to a place like Accra Digital Center, and now they want to multiply by almost 16. They want to put it in every region. And we say, well, what was the primary strategy? The primary strategy was BPO. Today, it has become a kind of glorified um, condo renting facility. People are just there renting facility, doing any, any kind of business. Very little of that is tied in to creating the digital entrepreneurship ecosystem because most of the startups that have been mm. admitted there are those that can pay the rent. Mm. And very little of that is tied to the BPO agenda for which it was built. Mm. So the idea was that you get um, the New York Police Department they send you all their images for annotation. Because of that, we train people in machine learning in Ghana. To do that and send they, it back. You no, know, because we add value in the mm. initial. Initially, you start with just data entry. Mm. And then because of the fact that you have the relationship, mm. we add the machine learning. And startups that are in machine learning can then become suppliers to the BPO provider. And you create an ecosystem. So that has not been done. None of that has happened. In fact, BPO uh, services are actually declining mm. in terms of total output. Call center facilities were supposed to be the people that others outsource their call center to. Recently, I just found out that my bank has outsourced its call center to India from Ghana. So more and more, rather than we becoming an outsourcing destination, companies are outsourcing processes outside. Mm. Mm. I know companies now that are using accounting service in the Philippines, et cetera, et cetera, because the BPO so that strategy promise has not been realized. could not be realized. What about things like um, one teacher, one laptop? Now the vice president was at a program where he wants to do one student, one laptop. Mm. Obviously, that's a good thing, isn't it? No, that, I mean, often the intentions can never be questioned, right? Because the intentions often follow from broadly understood principles mm -hmm. in digital development around the world. Mm -hmm. So get teachers uh, the, uh, mobile devices that help them with their teaching, eventually get students. You don't, I, don't, I don't know if you remember the one laptop per child. The problem has always been that 
and here it's a recurring theme. The problem has always been that rather than the thing being done in good faith, you have a lot of procurement drivers. That then leads to contradictions. So you go and do a one laptop per child, pro, a one laptop per teacher program, with in partnership with the unions, and then it turns out that you choose a company that has no history whatsoever producing devices, a company that nobody can point to and say here are the executives, here are who they are, and what. So you think the procurement objective is what defeats this technology? It is a sign. It's a sign that often it's not fundamental policy that somebody is changing. They are rather riding on the narrative to, to do their own thing. So the vice president elevates this to a certain stature. So anybody at all says, oh, it's part of the government's digitization agenda, right? Mm. And then all of a sudden, you create procurement opportunities. So what should he do? What should the government do? The go the, I think the vice president should be very careful about his image and its association with these types of uh, failures. We, we shouldn't have a one laptop per teacher program where the computers are so bad that every teacher that is critical is able to say, we didn't ask you to take money from our, our allowances and use it to buy this laptop. The laptop has one uh, gigahertz uh, speed. I mean, mm. all of these bad um, it's not good feedback is not helpful. And it can actually undermine the whole notion of a digitization agenda. So, so you're saying beyond laptop, whatever, you're basically saying that there's also underutilized capacity or some sort of... Um, you call unfulfilled it, yeah, promise. unfulfilled promise in the mm -hmm. technology space. What do you mm -hmm. mean? I've felt that one of the biggest issues we need to tackle mm. is the way in which the digitization agenda mm. becomes a narrative that people write to spend large amounts of money that don't return the, the, the degree to make, that doesn't generate the returns that you will expect given the amount that has been spent. So you're looking at e-procurement, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. And not too long ago, we decided to spend $5 million on e-procurement. Remember, the head of the procurement agency was found collecting kickbacks in sacks, literally. So that's how bad the situation is. The very head of the procurement agency was found taking kickbacks in, in sacks, cash, and then putting them into bank accounts. Now, if this, this, your situation is this bad and this desperate, and you decide to spend $5 million to fix it, how do you create a national e-procurement system where only two ongoing tenders are visible, only one advertised tender. Are you serious? Yes. So when we go That's to what you're when we go now, to Ganeps, go to the Ghana National E-Procurement Platform now, mm -hmm. and look at the output for five million dollars. Okay, so there are two projects: a tender number one, construction of number three. Projects in Atiwa. You so are look at Frempomso, Frempomso, Atiwa East District, and then construction of another. Yeah. So this, this is what is visible. This is all the, 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 the portal allows you to achieve. If you are interested in looking at current tenders, at, you know, what tenders are in the public sector so that you can apply, this wow. is what you get. Seriously? But, seriously. After $5 million and a lot of fanfare. How long has this been on? This has been going on from 2019. They, they we're supposed to have launched in 2019. You know. So only two projects are visible? Only two projects are available. Or two tenders? Two tenders. And wow. only one advertising, uh, advertisement. So wow. in essence, you have a situation where they make commitments to use technology to change things that we all accept are very bad. Wow. Like bad procurement or corruption. And so we're going to use technology to fix um, um, single sourcing. And, and then you go back and you look at it and they've done nothing whatsoever to fix single sourcing. It's Most crazy. projects are still single sourced. There is still no information available on them, on the electronic websites. You know, we spent $100 million on e-justice. You still go to the courts and you want documents. You still have to apply manually to the registrar, the, uh, the registry, and get it from the registrar. Mm. So your argument is that they spend money on the project, but they are not committed to delivery. We spent $100 million on GIFMIS. We spent even more on HRMIS. We spent more on Hyperion. We have spent more. If, after all of that, we still spend money on the electronic salary payment voucher system. And yet still, some people, it, it takes as much as two years to put them on the payroll. We have teachers in this country whose um, uh, arrests, dating back as far back as 2012, have still not been resolved. Wow. So our argument is that given how much we are spending on these projects, tens of millions of dollars, we should focus on these very critical issues. If I'm employed as a nurse, it shouldn't take six months, one year, for me to start getting my first salary. When you are digitizing the payroll system. Otherwise, what's the point of digitization when ordinary people cannot feel in their lives real transformation? How can we say there's national transformation based on digitization 
When the ordinary person has to wait six months before they get their first salary because it takes that long to enroll. Why? Because you centralize all the enrollment capacity in Accra with these technologies. And then when you get into the school, they don't even have the basic system to speed up enrollment. Mm. And then when, instead of solving that, you create a whole new project called Electronic Salary Payment Voucher that just benefited a private uh, provider and did very little to change the enrollment mechanisms at the level of the school. And then when you want to make changes, you then try and impose your a vendor on the system. So right now, for instance, the Ministry of Communications is trying to force all the investors to adopt a learning management software that is procuring from someone that nobody knows. The, the Ministry of Health is trying to force all hospitals in Ghana to use one software platform for electronic health records from a, from a vendor that is not better than the vendors that have already deployed these solutions. In fact, it's so bad, they are trying to force solutions that have already been deployed in the hospitals, in some of the universities. They want to force them out and bring in their preferred vendor. What kind of digitalization is that? And is all this within something that a champion like the vice president should be able to Exactly. To so what we are with. saying is that mm. in order not to lose credibility, mm. in order that this doesn't become something that begins to tarnish your brand, he should recenter the focus on actual policy deliverables. That means simply taking the projects, doing rigorous monitoring, making sure stakeholders are in the room. So for instance, if you are doing a project that is related to uh, digitization of hospitals, you cannot do that without a GMA, all of these people in the room asking hard questions. My argument is that too, far too often, these projects are designed and implemented with nobody critical enough in the room to ask serious questions. Aren't we giving too much responsibility to somebody like the vice president? Because you do know that in governments, they are not that powerful. So the argument is that if he really, really cares about this digitization thing, then he should refocus his mind on the real issues on the ground and address them head on. Mm. Not just try and milk it for political capital because it wow. will backfire. If he tries that, it will backfire because of all the problematic things we are observing on the ground. So that's advice that is coming very much from people on the ground in this sector who are worried about so many challenges across the board. In every, every part that you look, you have serious problems that have to be fixed. When we decided to do e-levy, Gibbs has all the capacity to do any reconciliation, if ever we decide to do e-levy. What was it about now putting aside millions of dollars for some other uh, um, um, company to come in and do verification and reconciliation and, and the rest of that? So we have to be careful. Because otherwise people are going to wake up to the fact that most of these things are merely lining up the pockets of well-connected bureaucrats, well-connected business people, and achieving no transformation on the ground. That's our concern. I'm sure we'll have more time to chat. Thank you for talking to us. Happy New Year to you. That's all we have time for today. We've been trying to get into the digital agenda of the government, looking at some of the vice president's initiatives. We haven't done an exhaustive analysis, but I'm sure the chips are there for you to see. We'll see you next time with another program. The Business Dashboard is next. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.